Good morning, everyone, and we welcome you to our Saturday morning Bible study. Today is February 9th, 2019, and we are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America, and we are so glad you can join us this morning. And our, today our moderator is Betty from California. Good morning. Um, I'm going to read the uh, quote. The scriptures are very sacred. Our aim must be to have them understood spiritually, for only by this understanding can truth be gained. The true theory of the universe, including man, is not in material history, but in spiritual development. Inspired thought relinquishes a material, sensual, and mortal theory of the universe and adopts the spiritual and immortal. It is this spiritual perception of scripture which lifts humanity out of disease and death and inspires faith. The Christian Christian science separates error from truth and breathes through the sacred pages the spiritual sense of life, substance, and intelligence. From Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy, page 547. Thank you. Thank you. No comments? Well, says the universe including man, this is how you should be viewing your development, not in your material history, but how much have you learned about God? That's all that matters. Keep going back to a lot of stuff that's better off forgotten. So, if you've learned about God, then good. It's your spiritual development. And why is the spiritual perception of Scripture so essential here? Because without it, though. <clears throat> without the spiritual perception is where we misunderstood some part of the message, the truth of it. Thank you. Because there is no other perception. I find that if we look at it just from a material view, which I did before, it doesn't all make sense. But spiritually, it totally makes sense. Right. There, there is no other perception of it other than its spiritual perception. To try to perceive it any other way is impossible. A lot of people get in trouble. They get hung up on the literal literal letter of the text, literal letter of the law, forget to consider what the spiritual essence of the whole thing is. This is why this Bible time is so important because that's what we endeavor to to learn about that always the spiritual interpretation which can be applied right now to us and the spiritual perception is unlimited whereas the human is limited only well it's limited it's wrong yeah and it's how many people view the Bible which is why it gets get a bad rap. And the, it gives us a higher sense of these stories and makes them, to me, it makes them rather practical that this is, we don't just read them and then that's it. You know, it, they are lessons, practical lessons that we discern from them when we're gaining the spiritual perception of the scripture. Yes. Thank you. And I call it the golden thread gone through time, it continues to go. And it's that golden thread is God's presence and power, the Christ, operating in all generations, past, present, and future. A lot of times after these Bible studies, things are cleared up such a nice fact. I wonder how, how I missed it before. <laughs> how, how, how did this not make sense to me before when it makes perfect sense now? So I'm very grateful for these Bible studies. Uh, 
I think we've all felt the same way. I know I have. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> well, and a lot of it is just not spending the time, the devotion to it. Treasuring our Bible. Well, and that's why churches are still necessary. You know, when two or three are gathered in my name, in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Yeah, so it's true. You know, whether it's groups in homes, but with the heart to really know the truth, that's God is in the midst. Well, I also want to Uh, oh, sorry about that. I um, also wanted to say, I have a friend who uh, lives in uh, um, out in the Central Valley, California, and uh, he was his church was having it in his home, and the uh, the town went after him and and stopped him from having church in his home. So, um, well, it may be okay to have a church in a home. I mean. It's kind of good to have a, a church so that uh, you don't have to be sending off the secular forces to just get together and meet, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I actually heard about that. Or I heard about one church, yeah, all they were doing was having Bible studies and they were they were told to stop. I, I don't know how that could be, but yeah. I guess times are changing. And if you do it, I mean, you think of some countries where they have to meet secretly. Well, good God, I hope I hope in the United States of America you don't have to meet secretly to discuss the Bible. <laughs> I can't do what I please in my own home. I mean, that's... Well, that exactly, <laughs> exactly. And we should be willing to fight these damned secular forces that are anti-God because they don't know God. They should be gotten rid of. And it feels like if they just told the cop, oh, we're just watching a football game, cop was, oh, okay, that's fine. Then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, I'm right, we're just having a Super Bowl talk here. Yeah, yeah. A little early, but... And, it, and every time <laughs> separate the Super Bowl, right? This is why we have to watch carefully the laws of the land, what's being... Um, passed and enforced, because these things come about quietly. We don't even know that they're happening, um, and they, they want it that way. And then the next thing, they have some law that will forbid you to do something that was once your right to do. And evil forces will use those laws to evil purposes yes. if they can. which is happening before our very eyes. Okay, anyone else or we'll move on? I, I just wanted to add my gratitude for this uh, Bible study, but that quote is so beautiful how it ties in to our lesson. I'm assuming that's not me. Uh, Someone has their computer on. Please turn it off because that creates an echo. You can't be on the phone and the computer at the same time. Okay, so all I was going to say was that I loved how she tied it in to this, some of the questions about the letter and the spirit, because to me this is speaking of the spirit, living it, and not just taking the letter, and also the um, concept that the spirit of the Lord and that's been through our lesson, and that's how Jesus healed. And I just thought it was a beautiful tie-in. Yes, thank yep. you. Are, are we ready to move on then? I am. <laughs> All right. The topic is, Our Sufficiency is of God. The Bible readings were from Second Corinthians 3. And I'll go ahead and start on the first question. Number one, in 2 Corinthians 3, chapter 5, it says, 
Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. What does this verse mean? I have a quote from the Red Book on page one seventy, uh, page seventy-one. Um, it's titled uh, "Body" by Mary Baker Eddy, and it reads: "Our sufficiency to think is of God. Our ability to form thoughts and opinions is of our own ignorance, our belief in duality. But our power and sufficiency to think is when we think with God, as God." That is beautiful, Mel. Thank you. Yeah. Good one to know. Page seventy of the seventy one of the red book. Yes. Thank you. Well, I, I was thinking about Gary had mentioned in a previously that um, Jesus, whenever he said I he was speaking as the Christ. And people were really annoyed about that, thought he had a lot of gall for doing that. But when I read this question, I realized it's more, it's more of, you know, like an inflated ego to say there is a duality, that I have the ability to think for myself, but it is the same, oh, I'm (laughs) doing something directly from God here, so. I don't know, I just thought that was a very different thought than I've had before. Thinking of this uh, question, all that kept coming to me was infinite mind, infinite mind. Well, there's nothing beyond infinite, so uh, I mean, God, mind, is sufficient. And uh, the words that I read about this is, my God is the sufficient one the one who is large enough, and also the adequate one. So um, there's nothing more sufficient than the the mind. Thank you. And uh, just the following what uh, Jeremy just mentioned, It it is humility, isn't it? to recognize and to admit that I am absolutely nothing without God. Without the Christ, I've got zero, nothing. Everything I have or am is of God. And if I think I have something in and of myself, besides God, I'm just fooling myself. I'd be humbled when you crash and burn, when you (laughs) rely on your own (laughs) understanding. Yeah, because when you try, you're bound to crash and burn. I mean, it's, it's impossible to succeed. Impossible to be at peace, it's impossible to have anything good that would last without it being of God. And it is why we declare daily that God is mind, God is my mind, God is the only pure and perfect mind, something we have to work at. So, as Mel said, we're not forming our own opinions and getting off track. When God speaks, it, it, it just comes. It, it's not like you're conjuring up something. Thoughts just come and flow. And it, there's a sense of peace and order. But when you're thinking things and thinking you're sufficient, well, things get bollocked up and you, you will feel various things, sometimes fearful, sometimes pressured, sometimes negative, down. I think in the the, um, uh, the lesson last week, I, I, there was a quote on, you know, 
uh, there should be a voice behind you which will say go this way or that way, which is... Thank you very much. That's right. That's, and that is what we've talked about in the lesson this week. It's your spiritual sense speaking. And that yeah. spiritual sense is always sufficient for all needs. So if you have some big, huge problem to tackle and you feel insufficient, well, when you know that it's God directing, he will give all that is needed. A couple of quotes from Mrs. Eddy, one in Miscellaneous Writings, page 41. The divine principle which governs the universe, including man, if demonstrated, is sufficient for all emergencies. Emergencies? How about that? <laughs> and then, this one I love so much. As Mary Baker Eddy, I am the weakest of mortals, but as the discoverer and founder of Christian science, I am what? Bone and sinew of the world. Bone and sinew of the world. She knew this fact. She had the humility to understand it. Gary was saying, humility, without that, you can't understand it. The first step, we say. First step. I looked up um, Spurgeon. He, he did a whole sermon on not sufficient and yet sufficient. But he said in the ver at the very end, the lesson to the Christian church, to you people of God, in your endeavor to spread the gospel, I say first, whispering it in your ear, trust no man who is self-sufficient. Oh yes, he can do it, it's easy for him to preach fine sermons, bless you, he can do it at any time and anywhere, he can convince and convert souls in any quantity. Did you read it in the paper? Glorious meeting. Eighteen souls out for salvation. Certain other preachers doubt him, but that's all jealousy. Our lowly, our lowly Lord will not have him. Christ's men are more apt at weeping than at bragging. They feel their inability rather than their ability. Then the man who does everything for the Lord is the man who cannot do anything without the Lord. And then, next, doubt not the sufficiency of the gospel in any case. Since our sufficiency is of God, you may take the gospel down that dark, horrible slum where there are none but thieves and harlots, and it will do its work. Since our sufficiency of, of God, with God all things are possible. You have a horrible neighbor who seldom speaks without an oath. Is he a wicked man? He is as wicked a man as ever lived, and therefore you never give him a sermon or speak to him about Christ, for you fear that your gospel is not suitable for him. He is just the very man that God may bless. Go and try that unlikely one. And it goes on. So I thought that was beautiful. Both, both thoughts, the first one about the humility and don't really trust the person that thinks that he uh, got it all under control. at the red flag. You know, in the Bible, who did who did who was chosen or who got the got the job? The yeah, God, the God gave out. Yeah, who got the job? Who, who got the job? Who was sent? Who were the ones? Were they the self sufficient ones? No, those who never no. thought they would be chosen. Yeah, absolutely. Who said, "Who am I? I can't do this." I can't speak. I'm as a child. Yeah, Mo <coughs> Moses was certain there was somebody else. But every time. <laughs> yeah, every, every time. Same thing is true of Gideon. You know, he led to remarkable things, 300 versus how many thousands. But when he was back behind the wine press, who am I? I'm the least, I'm the smallest, I'm the poorest, you know? God knows what's in the heart. 
Absolutely. And yeah. as Mary Baker Eddy, I am the weakest of mortals. She was the same way. Who was speaking, Florence? No, I said the same with David. David, you know, oh. when they were going through all of this, and no, not this one, not this one, until David came. So yeah. God chooses. God knows. And then that, a very, very important point. Who are we to say, oh, we can't help a certain whatever, a certain person, a certain country, a certain area, whatever, whatever would come to you. Your neighbor who doesn't like anything to do with religion, and he's an atheist or whatever, Who's, who are we to say? It's not our sufficiency. This is God's sufficiency. And how, how awful of us if we don't give it out to those who maybe are the ones most ready to receive it. We were so thrilled because we got our first letter from our new... Urdu, Hindu, Jabi website, Jeremy. Yeah, a um, man from India wrote to us and said that he read the Hindi lesson and that it was wonderful and he was so glad for it. And it, it was the very first lesson that we've had translated into Hindi. And it's actually the lesson for next week. So, <laughs> so we already found it. And it's only been up a couple of days. And, that was just a wonderful sign from God that it went forward right. So we, we prosper and bless this outreach with our prayers. I think it was fairly saying, she, and Mrs. Eddy has told us to know every day the world is ready for Christian science. We should be knowing that. And watch his prayers and arguments. And because a recent... Oh, sorry. Oh, that's it. I was going to say in a recent contact, they say they never read the Bible. See, so we never know who is going uh, to bless. It's amazing what God is doing. It is. I think people everywhere know that they're not fulfilled with what Mortal Mind saw them. I work with that a lot in my watches. I wasn't fulfilled. (laughs) And the last thing I suspected was that Christian science would be the way, but... I knew I wasn't fulfilled the other way. I think an example is I read something really interesting. Spiritualism came about in 1848, I think, from two sisters, and uh, they really didn't do much. But then because of the Civil War and all the hopelessness that everybody had from all the destruction and... and uh, the appearance of death and everything, and the philosophy and the, the current religion of that day didn't do anything, and that's when spiritualism went totally off the charts because uh, everybody was just grasping for something. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's very true. It's when the when there's a void when the when the church hasn't done what it should. That that's when these other things rise up. I also wanted to say about this issue about people who think they really got it under control and whatever. I love how Paul started this chapter in Second Corinthians by asking a few questions upon to those who thought that. They really like to hear how good they were. And he asked them, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? Or letters of commendation from you? And he got the thing going. Well, at least they need to look within. You really need to hear how good you are. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that uh, I read last week when we were doing the Bible study about the shepherd was that sheep, when they're very thirsty, will just drink anything uh, that they can find. And that's the shepherd's job is to make sure they have pure water so they don't drink contaminated water. 
and that speaks to what I feel I learned here at Plainfield, where we're spiritual beings, and we thirst, and we look for these uh, waters to satisfy it, and then if we don't have a good shepherd, then we're finding these pools of spiritualism and new age, etc., and it's very dangerous for us. So it just made me appreciate more this concept that, you know, the, giving the living waters and being sure that you're providing them for the, sh- the lost sheep. Absolutely. Good point. Good point. That's it. Thank you. Feed my sheep. Yeah. Yeah. And um, feed my sheep. That's a good lead into the next question, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, go one, ahead. One more thing from oh. Spurgeon. He said... I do not feel able, cries one, to win a soul. I feel it is work too hard for me. And Spurgeon says, continue to feel that truth of God, that humility, but at the same time let faith balance the feeling by reminding you that our sufficiency is of God, brother. If God sends you, he will go with you. And if God gives you a message to deliver, he will prepare the ears and the heart for that message. Blessed are these words for every minister of Christ and for all of you who are in any way are working for his dear name. Our sufficiency is of God. Well, that's it. Okay, we go the next. <laughs> <laughs> and the definition of sufficiency in the, the um, in 1828, the state of being equal to the end proposed. And so whatever is the end proposed, Anyway, question two. In verse six, it declares, Who hath, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit? For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What does this mean? I think we've heard people that will spout off the letter and come across as authoritative, but their life example doesn't support what they said. And the impact of that is that it tends to kill any desire for the scripture among those that hear it, or any respect that anybody might have for somebody who shoots off their mouth that way. (laughs) That's wonderful. So true. Well, and Paul experienced this, didn't he? Because when he was Saul, he was one of the chief Pharisees. He enforced the human law, thinking that it was God's law. And what did it lead him to? He condoned the stoning of Stephen. He rounded up Christians and put them in prison. He saw, he experienced firsthand what the enforcement of the law of the letter literally leads to. It was only when he received on his way to Damascus the Spirit of God, the better understanding of the law, that he was able to do God's work, and he did it wonderfully. But if anybody thinks that they can understand the letter without understanding the spirit behind it, they're going to screw it up. They're going to miss the whole point. In science and health, uh, under ancient under the marginal heading of ancient healers, uh, on page 145, it reads, uh, so divinely imbued uh, were they with the spirit of science 
that the lack of the letter could not hinder their work. And that letter, without the Spirit, would have made void their practice. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Betty speaks directly to it. Occasionally I watch this movie called Hawaii. When I first saw it many years ago, I was horrified by it. It's based on the James Commissioner book. And it's, it's, a lot of it is true, but it, it is about a minister and his wife who go to Hawaii to convert the heathen Hawaiians. <laughs> and I watch it because it backs me down as far as pushing the letter goes because it is horrendous. And he's doing it, this minister, all in the name of God to convert these heathens. And, of course, it led to great, in many ways, tragedy. Now, his wife knew better. And what his wife says and what his wife expresses of the, of the spirit is just, Wonderful. I've written down some of the things that she said because she saw it all so clearly. But it, it was such an example of the letter versing the spirit and the damage that the letter could do. He eventually learned his lessons and he became evidently someone who truly did help. But to go after anybody with that attitude, you know, in science we learn that's not true. You don't look at someone else as a heathen or stupid or anything. And yet, when Christians do this in the name of God, and, and he was certainly thinking and, and trying to do his very best, he thought he was helping. But that's the danger. Oh my goodness. We, we see it so often in so many places. You know, um, I can tell you about the effect of this from a conversation I had last year. So, and I'm, I'm also thinking of this because uh, you were talking about, you know, translating uh, the lesson in uh, Urdu. I, I can't pronounce it, but sorry. Um, you know, so I was talking with uh, the mother of uh, uh, this person uh, who was uh, native Hawaiian, and um, he's... Uh, He's the first uh, Native Hawaiian to win a Grammy Award for singing a Hawaiian song. So this is in 2017. So my, my conversation mostly with her was not so much about her son, but was how uh, the Hawaiian language had been virtually extinguished by the missionaries and how much work that she's doing today to bring back the Hawaiian language. And I'm thinking to myself, back then and also now, it's like, what does speaking Hawaiian have to do with being a Christian? You know, it should be okay. But now she associates with the, uh, uh, you know, obliteration of the Hawaiian language with being Christian, which makes no sense. But you can understand how they feel. That's right. That is right. And that is why... And I have mentioned with the Indians, the native Indians in America, but when the real pilgrims came who understood the Sermon on the Mount and practiced it, they got along together. But when these ele other elements come in, the human mind, it always is the human mind. And it's not just, I mean, we see it in the Christian science movement. We'll, we'll see it when parents can get into it and, you know, speak... I don't know, the jargon of science to their children or try to force things when there's no love behind it. You can do anything when there's love behind it. You can make a lot of mistakes, but when love's behind it, you're all right. And, and people will feel that love. But when you go in like some person who knows it all and is going to tell these people a thing or two, it, it does can do damage. I read, well, this is Mrs. Eddy, where she says, Ritual, ritualism and dogma lead to self-righteousness and bigotry, which frees out the spiritual element. 
Phariseeism. Phariseeism. Thank you. Phariseeism killeth. Spirit giveth life. And that's retrospection and introspection. We saw it with the Pharisees um, in the Bible. Their legalism, I guess it's called. Just the letter. And I thought this was this was good. This is just a short commentary on on a Spurgeon sermon. It's called Spurgeon on a Stupid Way to Read the Scriptures. <laughs> and it's from Charles Spurgeon's 1867 sermon, A Song at the Wellhead. So it goes, You are retired for your private devotions. You have opened the Bible and you begin to read. Now do not be satisfied with merely reading through a chapter. Some people thoughtlessly read through two or three chapters. Stupid people for doing such a thing. It is always better to read a little and digest it than it is to read much and then think you have done a good thing by merely reading the letter of the word. For you might as well read the alphabet backwards and forwards as read a chapter of scripture unless you meditate upon it and seek to comprehend its meaning. Merely to read words is nothing. The letter kills. The business of the believer with his Bible open is to pray, Lord, give me the meaning and spirit of your word while it lies open before me. Apply your word with power to my soul, threatening or promise, doctrine or precept, whatever it may be. Lead me into the soul and marrow of your word. Also, it is not the form of prayer but the spirit of prayer that shall truly benefit your souls. That prayer has not benefited you, which is not the prayer of the soul. You have need to say, Lord, give me the spirit of prayer. Now help me to feel my need deeply, to perceive your promises clearly, and to exercise faith upon them. In your private devotions, Strive after vital godliness, real soul work, the life-giving operation of the Spirit of God in your heart. That is how we should approach our lesson. That is how you should approach your, your study time. It's not how many paragraphs you read. and Don't even think about what you're reading. It's about your soul reaching out, your need. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so it is when you approach our sacred textbooks, the Bible and Science of Health, with that needy, humble feeling. Otherwise, you just memorize all these words, you can quote all these words, and you can put people down with all your words, but it's just words. And this is what makes us an able minister. Thank you. For we are ministering all the time, aren't we? Whether it's to our children, our family, our business, associates, our neighbors. Like Linda says, it's always Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all ministers. But if you want to be an able minister... And an able minister is living it too, whatever the inspiration is or the meaning that God gives. Yep. Yeah, that's the whole thing. If you're not living living it, that's what really... Then you're missing the spirit of it. You are. Yes. Yep. The and words are nothing without that. And you best keep your mouth shut. <laughs> that's right. Better to keep your mouth shut than to, than to blabble, blabble words. Oh dear, and I was going to say something, but uh, um, I really like what you just uh, said there about gathering the spirit of it, because when the material mind comes into it, it tends to pick and choose what it wants. I was really amazed in Leviticus to find that there's really a law from God that one should never uh, skew the scales 
the measuring devices for the grain, et cetera, was supposed to be absolutely perfect, not uh, cheating the people, you know, by measuring wrongly. And uh, an example, even in the Bible, of picking and choosing. Uh, and the next chapter is kind of a little more discouraging because it talks about everybody caught in adultery, but everybody gets stoned. Both parties get stoned, and it always fascinated me that when uh, they brought the adulterous woman to uh, um, Jesus, it was like, uh, who did she adult for it with because they only brought her? Our partner. Mm-hmm. Well, and that was the, that's what the Christian era is all about, isn't it? Jesus brought a higher level of law to mankind. Jewish law was thou shalt not. It was the acts, the appearances you had to worry about. Jesus said, no, it's your thought that you have to worry about. That's right. And he brought the law of love, too. The law of love. Exactly. I'm feeling you have to force people to be good. That's why we get so many laws. Yeah. Why we don't need any more laws other than the Ten Commandments. Within them is all the law. Anyone else on this one? Move ahead then. Okay, question three. In verse 17 it reads, quote, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, unquote. What does this verse mean? How is this relevant for us today? Well, I will start. Parthens has sent me something this week. Which, in a way, addresses this. The first part of it, I think there are two parts to this statement. Um... In it, it was written by Minister M-I-C-E. Mize. He said, during the Revolutionary War to win our independence from England, King George said he was much more afraid of the black-robed regiment than he was of the Continental Army. Who was he talking about? The minister. Yes. Yes. The preachers, the clergy, the ministers of the church who wore black robes to preach in on Sundays, and then after the service removed their robes, revealing their Continental Army uniform. But he was afraid because they would speak of the truth, and he knew that power that was behind it. And then also, many of you are familiar with Pokeville. He was a French diplomat, political scientist, and historian, and best known because he wrote a book, um, Democracy in America. It was interesting when our friends Bertrand and Florianne were visiting last April from Paris. I know Florianne was reading it. Anyway, she had it in the car, that book. I know my Russian daughter-in-law has poured over it. He writes about the United States when it was being formed and his observations, and it is an amazing book. I've only read parts of it. I should read all of it. But anyway, he wrote in 1835, I sought for the greatness and genius of America and the commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there, and her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there, and her rich mines and vast world commerce, and it was not there. In her democratic Congress and her matchless Constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard the pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because she is good, 
And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. And then in, in Spurgeon, he wrote another sermon on spiritual liberty. Who won our liberties for us? Who have loosed our chains? Under the hand of God, I say, the men of religion. We owe our liberty to the men of religion. And he goes on, you know, if you were under, if you were in a country where there, there is a false sense of God, they don't have Christianity. They don't understand the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. There's no liberty there. He, he starts his sermon off being grateful for the liberty that he had in England, because that's where he was from. So, there is a liberty, dear friends, with, and then he goes on to the second part of this, to of two liberties. I don't know if anyone has anything more to say about this first liberty, the liberty in our in our country that we have as Americans and other nations as well. Well, I thought when Tocqueville wrote, America is great because it is good. What is that goodness? What is the source of that goodness? Uh, yeah. something to be very sober-minded about. It, it goes hand in hand. The liberty of sure not having someone come close down your church and your house. It certainly is not. Certainly. <laughs> no. And the greatness of America is not in its manufacturing capability. It's not in its economy. It's not in its military size and strength. It's not in any of those things today as it was not then. There is greatness because it's the acknowledgement that God alone is great. When we lose that, we lose everything. A really good point, because some of the most powerful nations fell, like Rome. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and others. <laughs> Without God, no. Right. Not happening. It all turns to dust. John Gill writes very nicely about this, uh, you know, having the spirit where the spirit is in our freedom. And it's, uh, he says that where he is as a spirit of illumination, there is freedom from former blindness and darkness. Where he is as the spirit of regeneration and sanctification, there is freedom from the bondage of sin and captivity of Satan. Where he is as a comforter, there is freedom from fear of hell, wrath, and damnation. Where he is as a spirit of adoption, there is the freedom of children with a father. Where he is as a spirit of prayer and supplication, there is liberty of access to God with boldness. So that was very powerful. That is. Beautiful. You can put that on the forum, please. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, Mal, you put your first quote from the Red Book on, on the forum, too. Okay. <laughs> and this and this goes to the second part of liberty with spirit. There's a deeper liberty, isn't there? That we we know what is what is this is Eddie say about that? She says there, yeah, there's freedom of slaves and slavery, but then there's the freedom of the human mind mortal mind, freedom from sin and guilt, condemnation, 
freedom from yes than disease and death. And where that where that spirit is, there is freedom. I think in our lesson, Mrs. Eddy says it's the uh, Christian science is the only freedom from evil. I don't remember how it quotes, but very powerful. It has to be. I mean, without where where else is any freedom when you're thinking there's evil? We are believing in it and all that. So only Christian science is saying God is all, good is all. Yes, it goes deep, deep down into it. Um, destroys the root of the belief in evil. And gives the freedom that is, well, peace beyond past, past understanding. It is amazing what science can do because of the depth and breadth, breadth of it. And honestly, you know, that who was it that said, give me liberty or give me death? Thank you. Because who wants to live without it? And, and all of these articles always start off that it is man's inalienable right to it. Freedom is intrinsic as a child of God. Everyone yearns for it. Everyone should have it. One of the, another quote from that article Parthen sent me was by a Daniel O'Connor in 1829. He said, nothing is politically right, which is morally wrong. So you can gauge things on that. And Benjamin Franklin said, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. And you see, that is true individually, the tyranny of mortal mind, resisting it, not listening to it, not letting it take over your life. That's obedience to God, isn't it? Not doing it is disobedience. So it, it's a fundamental, fundamental to our Christian heritage, liberty, freedom, spirit. Harry said that will be the theme of our next liberator. <laughs> Very appropriate. <laughs> well, it is. And there's Liberation. Yeah. Yep. The spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Anyone else or should we go to the last? I just wanted to add very quickly that um, if anyone does any research in history, you will find that Mrs. Eddy was facing all the stuff that we are facing now, which makes her work very, to me, deep and profound and important in that light. Because when she's speaking to you, she's speaking from exactly from what we're seeing, politically everything. Yeah, in reading history, sometimes I feel it, it's just always been going on <laughs> like this. Always. It's all, everyone has the same challenges. It wears different faces and different political parties or whatever, but it's, it's the same error. We're either, we're either on side with God or, or we're not. That makes it interesting for me, too, that the Christ has also been here all that time, too. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> and Mrs. Eddy is so correct when she says that it becomes more subtle, the error, and it finds new ways. And when we open our eyes to what happened in the past, then there's a little different uh, slant to it. So it always comes back to correctness of being with God, which I really have to uh, engrave into my heart. Shall I move on? Sure. Okay. 
question number four. In verse 18, it says, quote, But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, unquote. What does this mean? When we see God's glory and God correctly and acknowledge God for what God is and for God for what God does for us, then we begin to see ourselves correctly. And not until then. Who else is by Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. May I read Matthew Henry said, quote, Converted to God, the veil of ignorance is taken away, and the bondage of the mind and hardness of the heart are cured. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Hmm. Well, in a glass is reflection. You know what Mrs. Eddy has said about reflection. We are reflecting the divine. We're not asserting selfishly our own arrogance. It also says with open face, we're receptive to what God has to show us about him. Then we see ourselves that way, by reflection. Yeah, and the open face is an honest look, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that open face. You know, you can tell when you meet someone if their face is open. They're not hiding. They're not hypocritical. They're open. And they're open They're open to that truth. They're also open to correction. They're open to see perhaps what they've done wrong. They're not coming in with, you know, this layers of onion skin all around them. <laughs> <laughs> layers of pride. Yeah, layers of pride. They're, they're open, receptive. There's a glass that's not filled, so you can't add anything more to it, but the glass becomes empty, ready to receive, open. Most important that you have that. You have to have it. Because if you come thinking you can hide things from God or you're not going to be open about your fault, well, then you're hiding them and covering them up. You've got to Got to let it all out. Open. Open face. And then in focusing on God, focus on God. You don't focus. Once you admit, this is sort of goes with on and purpose. Once you admit, well, okay, I, I've got things I need to change. I want to change. I want to be transformed. Then you focus on what's good. Focus on God, the enduring, the good, and the true like Mrs. Eddy talks about having the correct model and thought. That's very important, too, because you will mold yourself according to what you're looking at, won't you? So you focus on God. You focus on that. And then you're changed into the same image. Gary said it's just beautiful. And it's from glory to glory. I read a commentary saying, from mess to mess. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we can all feel like that, from mess to mess. <laughs> but when you adopt this, this open face, focusing on God, it will be from glory to glory. It won't be from, we used to say, from problem to problem. You will overcome whatever it is that's troubling you. You'll overcome it. It'll be glorified, and then you'll be ready for the next glory. Not the next problem. The next glory. And I don't know the quote, but Mrs. Eddy says something along the lines, science and health, that mortals know, know more of themselves than they know of God. 
something like that. Thank you. And Peter wrote a wonderful song about this, which we have, which has been sung more than once in church services, which which finish finishes with when I found God, I found me. And the Bible, we're told, when you seek him with your whole heart, mind, and soul, I will be found of thee. So it's, it's possible to anyone to find God, but you have to have that deep desire. You can't desire 20 other things and just have this down at the bottom of the list and then wonder why it's not working for you. It's got to be a deep, deep desire of the heart to know God. Behold his face. And then to be changed into his image. And the promise is there is nothing any more satisfying than doing this. It's also wonderful to, to find more of God and lose more of the trash <laughs> that I've collected. So I'm very glad for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. More of God and less of self. And God can only come in if you leave a spot for him. Get rid of the get rid of something, some trash. But if he can't come in. He can't come into something filled with crap. That's right, yeah. <laughs> That's why giving up the past, giving up all that ruminating, giving up all the people you sent, all of those things have to go. And all the pride, the layers of pride, as Mary mentioned, likened to layers of onion skin. Pride stinks like an onion. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else with any comments? Day. Well, thank you, Betty. This has been very, very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Thank, thank, you. Very good. thank you, Betty. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Very beautiful. It followed the the one on humility. So that's great. It's very much. Thank you, Betty. 